But I know when I wrote the first Market Wizards book, I was thinking of reminiscences of a stock operator, which I had read, yeah. you know, fairly recently then. And that was a book which was then 65 years old. And my thought was, wow, you know, this book is like 65 years old. It's like the days of the bucket shops on Wall Street. And um, it's still relevant. It's still had a lot of these, you know, lines that are strikingly relevant to trading. Uh, it's, it, that, so, that's one of my, I quote that book constantly. And people, I'm like, this book is 80, 90 years old now. And it's yeah. like, these quotes could be in a trading book today. <laughs> Hey, Steady Trade listeners, Tim Bowen here. Before we dive into today's episode, I'd like to talk a little bit about Stocks to Trade and Stocks to Trade Pro. Since you're listening to this, I have to assume you're serious about trading stocks, which means regardless of how you trade or your skill level, you need a tool to help you generate trading ideas. From live data feeds, technical and social media scanners, to the state-of-the-art Oracle scanner, Stocks to Trade offers everything you need in one easy-to-use platform. If you're new to trading and not quite sure how to get started, or maybe you're nervous about risking your hard-earned money, then the Stocks to Trade paper trading feature is perfect for you. You can practice strategies in real time with real stocks without the fear of losing money while you learn. Or if you're really looking to jumpstart and really dive in and really start your trading career for real, join me at Stocks to Trade Pro, where I give 11 live webinars a week and work with students nightly to help them become self-sufficient traders. I don't think there's any better way than twice daily webinars every single day trading day. I never miss a day, never call in sick. I've given over 1,750 webinars in three years. I think it's the best way to learn, grow, and improve and rapidly cut your path to consistency. So that being said, for pricing and more information, head on over to stocksatrade.com. And now let's get back to today's episode. So welcome back to the Steady Trade Podcast. As I mentioned in the introduction, we've got a, uh, you know, all of you know, um, if, you, if you've listened to many episodes, I'm a, I'm a hardcore reader. Um, I, I, if I had to pick, I've got many hobbies, but if I had to pick one hobby that I, I had to only do for the rest of my life, it would definitely be reading. Um, and also on the podcast, you know, we, we recommend books all the time. We're actually in the middle of the, the Steady Trade Book Club. And, uh, you know, a, a, one of the books that I recommend over and over again, and, and many people do, I mean, it's not just me, is Market Wizards by Jack Schwager. Um, Jack has a bunch of other great books. But, uh, you know, Market Wizards is really kind of one of those just, I, I think, must reads of, of, of if you're looking for inspiration if you're looking for the possibilities i mean i mean if you're listening to the podcast most likely you're new or or maybe intermediate or maybe you're new to to trading full time maybe you've gone from a retirement account to where now you're actually going to trade your own money and it's a great inspiration of of you know of of the possibilities and i mean jack interviewed I mean, all of the big names, whether it be Paul Tudor Jones, I mean, somebody I look up to immensely, Ed Sykota, Larry Hyde. I mean, the list goes on and on. So that being said, as I mentioned, um, we've got Kim back here, uh, Kim Ann Curtin, the Wall Street coach and the co-host of the Steady Trade Podcast. And then we've also got Jack Schwager. So, so welcome aboard, Jack. Hey, thanks. <clears throat> Jack, it's, it's awesome to have you here. I am uh, just excited to share you with, you know, the listeners and viewers, because I know that you have so much wisdom personally, individually, and you've also collected wisdom from so many amazing people. And I'm also excited to have you here because I am just forever grateful to how kind and uh, generous you are to me when I reached out to you when I was writing my book, Transforming Wall Street. I was very nervous to reach out to you. I thought, you know, you 
had uh, such a reputation of having been with the best of the best. And I thought, he's going to think, who is this, you know, little upstart coming into the game, wanting to write a book. I was so afraid because my book obviously was featuring 50 Wall Streeters that you would somehow think it was somehow like copying yours. But you were so gracious and generous and kind to me. And I just want you to know to this day how much that meant to me and made thank, such thank a difference. You. Thank you. Yeah, just, just how to say that to you. Um, and, the, and you also gave me like this beautiful testimonial for my book and it just meant the world to me. So, you know, it, it's just one of those things you're just always going to be in my heart in ways you don't yeah, understand. I remember you were, you were very sincere about everything, you know. Thank and, you. And, Thank and you. I like the idea. Your book was a bit uh, kind of taking, uh, looking for ethics, positive ethics on Wall Street, which is certainly a different slant. So. Yeah, 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 not, not, exactly, not exactly the Gordon Gecko model, that's yeah, for sure. And yeah. I appreciate uh, somebody recognizes some of us are, are deep. Absolutely. And that's, and that's part of what I felt too. You know, I was, I, you know, you said at the beginning, Tim, like how we met, we met because I had read Jack's book. And even though I was still formulating the idea of my book, when I saw the way Jack had posed, done the interviews, and, and that's why I want to advocate to the listeners, uh, you've got to read his books. I mean, there's multiple books on the market wizards, but every single one of them, you're speaking to them as human beings. Yes, they're traders, and you obviously respect their wisdom as traders, but you're speaking to them as people. And I think that makes them more relatable to any human being, never mind to a trader. Uh, and you glean, you, you know, we glean their personalities and their temperaments and how different they each are. They're each so unique that it just kind of gives you permission, I think, to imagine yourself. It, it being unique yourself as a trader. Yeah, I appreciate you caught that because, uh, you know, I, I, what I really, what I don't do is I don't go in with a list of questions and because I always think that's horrible, you know, I think that's, those interviews are terrible. And I, I just tell people, I'm going, I'm going to have, we're going to have a conversation, you know, that's basically it and see where it goes. Yeah. And that's a lot more interesting and, uh, and it takes you lots of different places. And, and I'm also interested in not just just in everything related to trading, also the backgrounds, because they could be very interesting and, they had a, and it has a lot to do with why they succeeded many times. Yeah, one of the, you know, one of, we, we, we do, you know, we, we, we do several interviews on the podcast and that, that's always one of my, that's how I always, I, I go to like the, uh, the, the comic book origin story, as they say, you know, you always, when, when you've got the comic book or, or the Marvel movie, there's always some point where, you know, the guy becomes the superhero. And that's, that's the way I, you know, to me, I'm a fanboy again, again, of a lot of these names, Richard Dennis, you know, a lot of these people. So it's like, that's, what's always interesting to me is, 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 you know, how did they get started? How did they come to this path? You know, especially to me, it's different today where we have the internet, you know, it's like, I mean, I mean, everybody knows about day trading now, but it's like, you know, I think about, you know, if, if it's the sixties or the seventies or the eighties, how did you even know this existed if you grew up in a small town or something? Yeah. How, how did you find out about trading, Jack? Oh, I, well, I had no problem with the trading. I was just looking for a job out of graduate school. Uh -huh. And so uh, the job I ended up with was a trading analyst job. And it was, so not a trade, a market analyst, I should say, not trading analyst, market analyst uh, on the future side. And uh, I mean, that was, the mar that was a job that exposed me to markets and to trading. And uh, I, I had no particular interest before then or knew anything, or certainly no knowledge about it. So it's pretty much by accident that the job that I found out of graduate school happened to be, happened to be uh, you know, a research, a research analyst job. That's amazing. And did you, do you feel it immediately you said this, I'm going to take this for the distance? Did you love yeah, you it know, right out of the gate? I, uh, what I discovered, you know, so I got into futures in the early, well, early days. I mean, futures have been around for 150 years or whatever in the U.S., but, you know, relatively early in terms of it being anything. So uh, that was 1971. We're talking really, we're talking before currency futures, before stock index futures you know, and so forth, you know, so before the markets, uh, before the markets, that the, all the interest rate futures came later. In fact, the first one was this odd contract on Ginny Mays, um, which didn't come until a few years after I had started. 
So it was still fairly early on. It was tr traditional commodities. But what I did, uh, what, what I discovered was that the, and in those days, there were research positions in futures. It was a bit of a different world. And what I discovered was that it wasn't very, you know, the research that was being done wasn't very good. So I kind of said, hey, I, you know, I could kind of excel here, you know. And it was interesting. And what I liked about it was, you know, the markets, they're always, like Ed Sakota says, they're always changing, right? So it, it required some creativity, some originality. So there was no textbook on how to, there was no textbook on how to trade or, well, there may have been, but you know, the, there really wasn't, there, there, or how to analyze markets. In fact, because I thought there weren't any good books on it, um, about 12 or 13 years after I started, I, I took a sabbatical to write a, a textbook type, not a literal textbook, but yeah. more of a textbook type of book on, on futures. Wow. Um, but that would appeal to me was it was, it was, it was required, your own approach or coming up with your own approach and there was no standard it wasn't i was looking for something that was not constant and boring and repetitive and it, it had fulfilled that it fulfilled those conditions totally totally Got now that. now you know this is you know our, our obviously our our podcast you know again is 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 geared towards the new trader so we we skew young here you know i i think you know it's, it's probably a lot of millennials etc listening so i think that that it's going to be interesting so what is what is the research? How, how do you do research in 1971? There's no internet. There's well, there's first, no there's there's no oh, Google. So so so, so you know you know it, explain. How, is it boots yeah. on the ground? Are you driving around? Explain. You know, what is that research? So so first of all, I came out of economic you know, in economics graduate degree in economics. So I say that for context, and I knew nothing about technicals for several you know for while after I started. So I didn't even think, well, I'm gonna approach the markets technically and fundamentally. There wasn't that choice. It was an <laughs> economic problem. It's how do you predict where this market, where where a market's going? So I did stuff like regression and I would, you know, gather data, do regression analysis, that type of thing. It was basically more of, you know, just the fundamentals and learning the fundamentals and applying statistics and economics to it. Which doesn't work that well, by the way, uh, because because fundamentals in that sense really, even if you do it right, even if you do it well, it's only good for giving you kind of a a big picture of where the market, if a market's relatively underpriced or overpriced, and then you have to be right and you have to be no unexpected events, there have to be no changes in the data. There's a lot of ifs in that, and it doesn't give you the inter interim moves. So it's not, you know, ultimately it's not, it wasn't the ideal way to do it, uh, but it was how I got started. Wow. And, you know, and again, I think just, just, you know, it just, I, I, cause I'm curious, you know, I'm, I'm actually, I'm on this big, uh, you know, Kim and I've talked about it. I've, I've actually recently stayed at the TWA hotel. So I'm on this big, like rocket age kick, you know, like, like pre-technology. So you know, as you're doing this, I mean, I mean, did you even have a computer in the early 70s? No, I mean, no, yeah. no. So we're, yeah. talking, we're talking the early 70s. No, yep. so you didn't. I had a cal I had one of those calculators that you right. <laughs> that sat on your desk and you kind of, and if I did a regression analysis, I would do it on a calculator, not a spreadsheet. You get yep. <laughs> the, the Apple, even the very, very first PCs didn't come in until I think late 70s, maybe. Yep, 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 yep. Yeah, the Apple one, and, the Apple two, and, and 79, so 80. The early yeah. days, and I didn't become a computer. In fact, when I did my first book, which I, the sabbatical I took was 1983. And even that book, I didn't have a PC. I, there was no spreadsheet. You know, I was still doing stuff on a calculator and stuff like that. Wow. Uh, so it was crazy. Uh, in graphs, I wasn't, I wasn't charting graphs on Excel. I was literally, you know, doing it by hand and getting yep. somebody to, to trans, you know, to transcribe it into a, into a nicer picture, you know. That, That's wild. That, it, did you did you feel uh, this kind of curiosity that informed the market wizards when the market wizards came out initially? Was it it was in the eighties, wasn't it? When the first it was 88, 88, yeah. I, well, no, it came out in eighty eight, eighty eight. Well, came out in eighty nine. I I wrote it in eighty eight. And what in, what informed your wanting to speak to them? You stole my question. <laughs> yeah, well, he, he, no, I knew something. My first job we talked about him was. Uh, you know, that, that analyst job, uh, I was taking Michael Marcus's uh, position. You 
now, who, be, who was actually, who was going off, he was leaving to become a trader. And we stayed in touch for, you know, we stayed in touch kind of, and then he went off to California. And then we weren't in touch much, but I knew him. And Wait, uh, who was this? I'm Michael Marcus, who's chapter one of the Market Wizards. Yes. So I knew him and Michael had hired uh, Bruce Kovner, you know, he, he, Bruce, you know, that's how Bruce Covey got into business because Michael, Michael, Michael hired him. And in fact, actually, Michael hired me as a researcher for, for Commodities Corp. That's a different story. Uh, so I had that connection to, to Michael uh, and, and Bruce Covener. And, you know, through that, I, knew, I think I may have known some other people through them. And Michael introduced me in our interview. Michael gave me at Sakota. You know, he said you should interview at Sakota. So it was that type of thing. So I had some, I had some contacts, and I thought it would be, uh, it would be interesting to kind of pick their brains and, uh, and you know, what what made them so successful. So that was it seemed like a fun thing to do, and uh, I didn't have a whole, I kind of, I, I had only a, a less than a handful of people that I knew, and from that it went forward. Were you surprised that it became what what it is still to this day? Do you- is there, was there a it, surprise? You know, I have trouble with the question because, and there's no way I can say this without sounding kind of egotistical, but, and I, I, every time I have an interview, somebody raises that question, I say this, and I have to go back to the book and see if I have it in the preface. But I know when I wrote the first Market Wizards book, I was thinking of reminiscences of a stock operator, which I had read, yeah. you know, fairly recently then. And that was a book which was then 65 years old. And my thought was, wow, you know, this book is like 65 years old. It's like the days of the bucket shops on Wall Street. And um, it's still relevant. It's still had a lot of these, you know, lines that are strikingly relevant to trading. Uh, it's, uh, that, so, that's one of my, I quote that book constantly. And people, yeah. I'm like, this book is 80, 90 years old now. And it's yeah. like, these quotes could be in a trading book today. Yeah. You know? yeah. so, <laughs> so when I wrote, when I was writing Market Wizards, I did, and I, I really curious, I got to go back here. I have this one, I'll do it. I'll go back and look. But I know I had the thought that I wanted to, uh, I wanted to write a book that like, reminiscences would still be relevant 65 years when I was writing it. So I did have that goal. Yeah. So you asked me if I'm surprised, I guess in a way, but I did go, I did have, that was my objective. That was yeah. my objective. It was an intention. I mean, it, here, it sounds like that was a really big intention. I really had that, I did really had that thought. And I, I had the belief that trading was something that was timeless, the truths about trading and, uh, are timeless. And, and therefore I thought that, you know, if it's done right, it should be relevant, like I say, 60 years. I, I feel so many, uh, the, so many of the truths about trading are not only timeless for trading, but timeless for life. Yeah, and, and there were, yeah, there were definite connections. There were definite connections between trading and life. And, um, you know, like, give you just like an example, um, like cut your losses short. I actually adopted that as a life philosophy. And I, I remember to this day, my wife, you know, we would go cross country skiing. You always have a problem because you depend on real snow. Um, you know, you can't, so you get one rainy day and it kills everything. So I remember once we went on a vacation, went out west and, and, it, and it rained and then we, we went, we then, I said, we're not going to stay at this place. So we would, you know, we had a reservation at that hotel. We would like book another flight to some other area where we went to Canada or whatever. And just cut your losses short. There's no point staying in a hotel looking at the rain. You know, it is what it is, and just totally. uh, just totally. you know, cut your losses short. And, and so, I kind of adopt that as a as a life philosophy too. That uh, if 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 something's a loss, you know, that's it. Just cut it. You know, doesn't pay to stay with it. Totally. Totally. Yeah, it's funny. I, uh, you know, something that I, I preach on the podcast a lot is, you know, having a plan, you know, you know, what is your plan in this trade? What's, what's your stop? What's your profit goal? You know, what's your thesis? You know, what are you going to do if some un- unforeseen news comes out or whatever? So I say it all the time, have a plan, have a plan all the time. And, and it's the same thing. It transfers like, even like my wife and kids. I'm like, if, if the wife is like going, I'm like, what's your plan? You know, what, what are you doing? She's like, well, I'm just getting groceries. I'm like, okay, you know, but, but I just think in that mindset of all these like contingencies in your risk to reward, but yeah. <laughs> awesome. All right, so I have another question, Jack. Did you have anything that really shocked you 
when you were interviewing these market wizards? Was, was there anything that you just did not see coming and kind of blew you away? Well, it no longer shocks me because it happens all the time, but I was surprised originally about how many of these traders had failed miserably, you know, yeah, spectacular as, they, as their performance ultimately became. I was shocked by how many of them had failed and sometimes multiple times. So that was, a, that was certainly a surprise. Um, I suppose just the idea that they were so all, they were all over the place personality-wise. There, there, is no, there is no prototype in that respect for a successful trader. So the, the tremendous range in personalities was surprising. I would have thought maybe they would share more commonality in that way. Um, and not, a, I wouldn't say shocked or anything, but you know, now it's kind of secondhand, but I certainly didn't realize it starting out in the book that I went in finding, well, you know, what are these guys doing that they are so successful? What is their approach? What is it? And, and really discovered in the process, it's nothing about their approach so much as it is about their money management and sort of that realization that it was really money management that was more kind of at the core of, of all these successful traders than it was actually a specific method, so, so much to speak. When you speak about the failure, you know, just speak a little bit more about being surprised by that because I think that my understanding of the pain that these, the viewers that we have have around being a new trader is that there's a bit of a fear and intimidation. Tim is also going to be training me how to become a trader, which I've never farried into. So I'm a little nervous and I can feel my nervousness is over the failing. So just speak more about what, what that surprised you. And if you could imagine these, you know, young novice traders that are watching us, how, what is that lesson there for them around that comfort with failure? Well, there's a couple of lessons. One lesson, is, one lesson is just because you fail initially doesn't mean you're going to be a long-term failure. Because I can point to lots of people who were failures to begin and became very successful. What was more important was just this belief. In fact, like we talked about Michael Marcus, you read that chapter and it's like, you know, at one point I say to him, you know, it's like story after story where it was just disaster. And I won't <laughs> go through it all here. But I said to Michael, I mean, didn't, at some point, didn't you just kind of say, hey, maybe, maybe I'm not cut out for this? And he said, no, I just kind of like, he, lose, he used the analogy of, uh, you know, Fiddler on the Roof and the protagonist is on, you know, like looks up at God and talks to God. And it's not like he's literally talking to God, but he was like, and paraphrasing here, and he said, am I really that dumb or whatever? And, I'm like, and he just got the answer, no, he could do this, you know, he could do this. And uh, you just had that inner relief. So it, it, that drive is just that belief that he could do it. And it's not going to be, it's not true for everybody. And not everybody who has that belief is necessarily going to succeed. But there is a lesson there that that, that drive is kind of a thing that, that is why people do, do overcome failure. And it's probably not just true of... Uh, just trading is probably true in, in, in other things as well. If people have a sufficient drive, they can overcome the inertia. You know? So that's one lesson. Yeah. Um, I would say not so much a lesson from the books, but from my own personal experience, advice. Very important about like early failure. Most people fail at the beginning of trading. Uh, that's a reality. Yep. And so given that as a fact, and this, is, this holds true not only if you're an office, this basically holds true uh, even your experienced traders. And uh, I can think of an interview I just did for this book I'm working on now where, where the trader had the same inclination. Uh, and the idea is that you set uh, an amount that you're going to willing to lose. You know, whether, whether it's in percent terms or dollar terms, I mean, it's the same, you know, basically. So you know, let's say you say, well, I'm, I'm going to... I've got fifty thousand dollars here. I'm going to trade with, but if I lose ten thousand, um, that's it. I don't care what it is. I don't care what my positions are. I don't care how hopeful I am. If I lose ten thousand, I'm just not doing something right. I'm out. I'll go away. I'll take a breather. I'll refigure out what I did wrong. I'll wait until I feel the urge and the necessity to come back. Now, I've done that. I'm not. I don't trade for a living, and I, I trade as a hobby. And there are only when I have time and. And usually I'm too busy to bother trading. And so sometimes I'll get into it, sometimes I don't. 
But whenever I start training, I always have that mentality. I'm going to risk this much. And, and it's always a ridiculously small amount. Yep. <laughs> and, and, uh, and if I lose it, I stop. I don't care. So <laughs> the, 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 and in fact, all the mistakes I've made always, the, any big losses I've taken, have always been only after I've made money. It's always been only after I've made money. Because in the beginning, I'm always so cautious. I, I can lose a ridiculously small amount. Okay, fine. You know, I, I come back a few weeks later, a few months later. I don't really care. Um, but if I have a period night to have a good run, I make a lot of money. Then I, get, I mean, now hopefully I wouldn't do it again. But I have in the past had experience where I get ahead and not, then I get kind of sloppy. And yep. I could be losing 100 times as much as what would get me out of trading in the beginning. But because I'm ahead, it happens, you know. So I kind of know that now. I know, and in fact, when I wrote that, uh, uh, not one of the full markers, but I wrote a little thing called Little Book of Marker Wizards, which yeah. just took some of the lesson, like 20 lessons out of all the books. And, and I remember that that was, uh, I think one of them, whether well, it's one of the lessons or it's a line in there, but it's something like, if, you, if things are going really great, watch out. Yep. And I kind of wrote that for myself. <laughs> so, um, so you I know, think. and that's something, you know, that, that I've, I've, you know, with dealing with a lot of younger traders and stuff, I, I, I caution, you know, cause it's, you know, especially, you, you, you know, in these, in these big movers, you know, in these, in these fast moving stocks, you can get lucky in the beginning and, and you can do really well in the beginning. And I always caution people. I like, I'm like, man, I would rather, I would rather it be a disaster your first six months than have it be just perfect the six months. Because, because just like you said, in the beginning, if you're down 50 bucks, you're losing your mind. You're like, oh my God, I'm down 50 bucks. <laughs> but if you may have this incredible run and let's say you're up a hundred grand in six months, all of a sudden you're like 50 bucks, whatever. And then all of a sudden you're down 50 grand and then you're down 80 grand, you know? So, so yeah, I, I, I always, I, I'm like, when people have that early success, I'm like, oh man, I almost know what's coming. So. But the, but the best thing traders can, new traders particularly can do is just set an amount that if you, that you will, that you can lose, that won't affect your life, that yep. won't make you depressed forever, that you can come back from, and whatever that amount is, that's what it is, and stick with that. That's kind of, I think, for novice traders, I think is maybe one of the most important pieces of advice I could give. You know, Jack, I was curious, what of your, you have so many great books. I, I feel Market Wizards, the first original one, is like a, a must read. And I really liked your Market Sense and Nonsense. Uh, that book, I thought, especially for traders, but what do you, what do you think of your books, or the best, like, two or three? that new traders would be best served to read. That's, a, that's like asking him to pick his, pick his favorite child. I know. Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> well, it is. It's a specific um, group, right? It was, you know, like I've written, uh, I, I've written um, for, you know, for Market Wizard, you know, the full, not, the, not counting the book of Market Wizard, which is in the same format, but I've written four Market Wizard books. And I would say, Except for one, I, I, I think the, the weakest one was stock market was just because some of the people I picked for there, I, I, I knew when I was writing it, I was writing it at the cusp at the end of the bull market sort of, but I thought that the people I was picking were successful. You know, I was cognizant of that, but in, in, without naming names, was like, I thought that their success, you know, they were successful, they, not just because it was a bull market, but it turned out some of them were. So, so I would say I wasn't thrilled with some, in hindsight, some of my choices for that book maybe weren't as good as for the other books, although that book still has some really good chapters in it and still has some good stuff. But I would say so, but the other three, Market Wizards, New Market Wizards, Hedge Fund Market Wizards, I, I don't know, you know, some people, some people like, I guess more people probably like the, you know, maybe the Market Wizards, but not by, it's not by a large margin. Mm. And, um, Market was so I, I think all three of those, uh, there's not a big difference, I think, they, uh, in them. Uh, Jack, you might have gotten interrupted. I'm not sure if it was my signal or yours, but just say the three names again, just in case. Yeah, oh, I did uh, hiccup market, real quick. Yeah, so, yeah, so yeah. Market Wizards, New Market Wizards, and Hedge Fund Market Wizards. Okay. So between those three, I, I mean, I don't have a, I don't feel like one is dramatically better than the, than any of the others. Uh, they're all the same format, 
maybe the first one because it was the first one. And so, yeah. you know, it's sort of, sort of credit because the, then the other ones copied what was a successful format. Yeah. But content wise, there's different traders and all of them. There's different stories and all of them. And uh, there's different, the less there are similarities in the lessons, but there's also different lessons in all of them. So it's, it's hard to say between those three. And what's your new book about? What's your new book? How, oh, how so, so the, the last regular market wizards book I did was about seven years ago. It was hedge fund market wizards. So this time I'm doing the exact opposite. Instead of taking like hedge funds, you know, people trading a billion dollars, I'm going the other direction. And my working title is unknown market wizards. And I'm basically oh. interviewing like individual traders that Beautiful. for the most part, nobody has heard of who are doing just spectacularly well. And I saw on Twitter, you were looking for traders that wanted to yeah, be considered. So yeah. Is that too late? Is that door? Is that no, it's not too book? late. I'm still writing it. I'm still writing it. Okay. I got more traders than I could use, but I'm still open to, 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 new, uh, to new possibilities. And, uh, so, the, so the viewers, okay. if one of them thinks that they might, they need to be considered, they should reach out to you through the funcedar.com site? Yeah. Yeah. So, well, actually, so new, it wouldn't work for new traders because one of the things I'm looking for is kind of ideally at least 10 year track record sure sure but I, but i, I, th I think kim's I'm point is if if someone happens to randomly stumble across the podcast yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and sure sure and i'm sure you probably get listeners or uh, viewers who are not absolutely who are not um who are not you know newbies necessarily um so ideally you know so ideally 10 years if the track record is really spectacular then i'm willing to consider something as short as seven years and okay i mean cool. I, I have some people who have like extraordinary records and uh so maybe the record is like seven, you know, seven years, but it's truly extraordinary. So, so I'm willing, I'm not hard fast on any particular rule. Like ideally I'd like 10 more, 10 or more, but I'm willing to go a little shorter. I can't do anything somebody has two or three years because no matter how good it is, I just can't do that. Well, I mean, especially in the, I mean, especially in this market last, if, yeah, if you, you know, in last two or always, last two or three years, it's been yeah, pretty wild. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I, I'm also, I also look a lot on, well, so it could also be like spectacular returns or it could be spectacular return risk, it could be either one. And for to return risk, I don't particularly use the Sharpe ratio, but since everybody's kind of familiar with the Sharpe ratio, I'm looking for like thing, records that would be like equivalent to Sharpe ratios of two or better. Uh, although some, a lot of these traders have, you know, much better numbers than that. Um, Jack, when the book comes out, will you come back on as a guest to talk about the sure, stories sure, that you sure, got? Sure. Terrific. Sure. Terrific. Awesome. Yeah. I'm so excited. Yeah, and there's some interesting, there's some really, inter I mean, there's some really unbelievable people that I found. It's like, you've already found some. So you've oh, found yeah, no, I've already written, I've already written four chapters. And, wow, that's fabulous. And I've done, and I've got probably another 10 interviews I've done that I have, that I have to write, you know, that I have to go through the tapes right up. Okay. So, uh, yes, yeah, so I already have a sense. I have a sense of you know, who's going to be in the book. Now, I, I, I will. We'll kind of. We'll kind of head home here. I just got a couple questions. Um, sure. What, uh, you know, I, I was like, especially with someone like you that's got, I mean, you're going back to 1970, you know, it's, it's 50 years of market experience. I only know that because I'm, I'm creeping up on 50, but uh, 50 years old, that is. But, uh, you know, what, what, what's like the, whether it be from the book or whether it be from your history, what was like the, what's like the wildest story or, or like the, or the wildest story you were told or you saw or, or what, you know? Oh, um, wow. <laughs> it was a wildest story. I mean, there's quite a number of them. Um, <laughs> But, but I, I think the most incredible one, you know, I mean, the idea that it's actually happened uh, would be probably Stanley Druckenmiller. Mm -hmm. And going back, certainly a lot of your, your audience would know, would know this except from just history, but the 1987 crash. Yep. And I mean, the 1987 crash was truly extraordinary because it was, I mean, a stock market and, and the stock market, the, the actual stock market could never actually, the tape never caught up. Yep. So yeah, I think officially it was down 23%, but that's only because the tape never caught up by the end of the trading day. Futures, which were discounting, you know, the uh, additional sell-off, I think they were down something like 29% one day. One day, we're talking about 
the index, <laughs> the major index. Yeah, but, and index. just just for we're people, we're not talking just, about a market being that. We're talking about the know, index being down twenty nine percent, or I mean, based on futures, and and it happening without any really news. I mean, there wasn't any big news or anything. It was just bang. Well, so that's the context, and so you talk about a crazy story. Stanley Druckenmill at the time is ma managing multiple funds for Dreyfus and uh, was actually short, you know, basically in these, in these funds where you could go short, he was actually net short going in to that crash that Friday. And uh, people don't necessarily know that, but I think people who know about the crash out of the image, all of the market just like had a top and then just crashed. No, it actually had been going down sharply and then had that 29% down. So the week before it went down, that at that bad day, it was actually a pretty, pretty strong sell-off week. So Drucker Miller is there, and, and he also uses technical, he uses fundamental, he uses technical. But the market was coming down to kind of support levels. And so he kind of figures, well, you know, take the money. You know, it's coming to the weekend, it's had a big sell-off, take the money. But that wasn't only it. He also thought, well, might as well go short. Um, so I'm long, I'm sorry, might as well reverse from short to long. So he reversed long, he only reversed from short to long, he reversed from short to leverage long. Okay. <laughs> and, and the next, you know, then over the weekend, without going into the whole story, over the weekend realizes he made a mistake. He's convinced he made a mistake. Monday morning, the market has gapped down like 12%. Yep. <laughs> and he's just reversed from, 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 uh, from being <laughs> short to long. I mean, and, and, and leverage I mean, long. <laughs> yeah, leverage long. And so kind of a mind boggling mistake. And uh, what he, and he, and for that month, he ends up not even, I, I, don't, I don't think he, he lost a small amount of money, if anything. And the reason was because he knew he was wrong. So the very first thing he does with the market gapping down 12% is get out of everything and then go back short. <laughs> so that is kind of the most incredible story I can remember. So you have to be able to do that. It is also the epitome of, of a great, you know, professional trader. Exactly. That that's real you're trading. Able to reverse yep. to reverse like that. I mean, to get out of a position, the sign of a really good trader would be to just get out of everything and and not hold. That would be the sign of a really really good trader. But to be able to reverse again, my God, that's that's extraordinary. Yeah, and just just for the listeners, you know, you think about that, you know, a a a, a thirty percent drop, you know, that the the Dow the Dow was at you know twenty eight thousand today, you know, that'd be like a ten thousand point drop yeah. in the Dow. Just yeah. for the list, you know, well, for the not, listener out there well, to, yeah, to equate okay. that. Yeah, yeah. But, but the ten percent, you know, so you know, be down. Think of it, you know, what the ten percent will be in, in one overnight. Yep. Yep. So last question, and, and then I'll, and I'll kind of let Kim close this out. So obviously you, you've, you know, you've interviewed some of the greatest of all time, most of the greatest of all time. And the attraction to, you know, to again, our listeners is obviously they, they probably want to be the next Paul Tudor Jones. You know, what, what's, what's like, so I'm out there Googling, learn how to trade. I, I come across the podcast. I'm getting started. I'm a complete newbie. What, what, what's, what's your advice, you know, from, from talking to all of these guys and all your years and around them? So. Well, uh, my advice is multiple, multiple pieces of essential advice, if you do. Okay? So first of all, you've got you to figure out what you're going to do, what your approach is going to be. I mean, there's, there's, there's no, I mean, there's lots of things that pretend to be a guide, you know, guidebook to it, but there really isn't. It's a, uh, you have to really find your own, own yep. approach. So that's a key thing you have to understand. And, and, and nobody can tell you what your right approach is. No more than if you called up a stranger and asked them, um, what size shoot, suit should I get? There's no way they can tell you uh, because they don't, if they don't know you, they can't tell you, you don't know what your size you're on. You know, so it's something you have to figure out for yourself. So to figure that out, you have to start out by reading, by watching, by looking at markets. And so you have to read a lot of, different market books, see what resonates, see what makes sense, look at markets, try to incorporate, play around, don't trade, you know, just kind of figure out where you, what is your, you have to, before you can trade, you have to figure out what is your approach, you know, you just can't go out, I mean, you can go out and start buying and selling or whatever without knowing what you're doing, but that's not going to end well. <laughs> so the first thing you have to do is figure out what your approach is, and that's, that could take a while, that could take years even. 
Um, and once you think you've developed the methodology, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade with real money right away. I would start out paper trading. Now, paper trading is not the same because you don't have the emotions of it. But if you can't make money paper trading, you sure as hell ain't gonna make money with real money. Right? So, so if you're gonna screw up, you might as well screw up on paper first. And, and, it, and of course, if you're successful in paper trading, it doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna be successful, but at least it's some evidence that you're doing something right. Okay, so now once you're that far, then, then follow the rule I mentioned earlier, which is decide how much money are you willing to, to risk? And it shouldn't, be, it shouldn't be any amount that exceeds what you could comfortably absorb as a loss. And then, and then trade, keep a diary, particularly of what, you know, of what you do right, but even more importantly, what you do wrong. You know? <laughs> um, and, that, and that takes discipline to do that, but it's important because that's the way, that's the way you learn. Um, and, and I will also say you have a plan, you know, what you say to have a plan. Um, one of the rules I would say is, uh, and it's not mine, it's like the multiple traders said it, uh, but the idea is know where you're going to get out before you get in. You know? yep. so, so you define your, and that's actually, when I gave it the portfolio rule, it was the same thing. Know you cut your portfolio before you start trading. This is like on a trade basis, know where you get out of a trade before you put the trade on. And that's important because it defines what your maximum risk is going to be on a trade. It's important because the one thing you have uh, until you put on the trade and that you instantaneously lose the moment the trade is on is objectivity. Yep. <laughs> so you may as well, you may as well make the rational decision before you put the trade on. So, uh, so th th in a nutshell, those are key points of advice I would give to new traders. I love it. I mean, it, you know, and again, it, it's, it's so awesome to again, hear it from somebody like you that started in 1971, that's interviewed all of the greats. I mean, I mean, this is stuff that, that I, I beg people. I'm like, just, I'm like paper trade, make sure you can be consistent paper trading. You know, th and the biggest thing that, that, that gets my goat for lack of a better term is, you know, everybody's always thinking about, well, I can make this. And I'm like, well, what's, what's your risk? What's your downside? Well, you know, eh, I'll stop out here. I'm like, no, what is your downside? I mean, what do you, what, you know, before you press that button and I, you know, I preach people, I always use like this index card methodology or post it. I'm like, what is your stop and stick that on your monitor and stare at it? Because as you mentioned, once you're in, man, everything goes out the window, especially if you're new. And I've always said, if you've got that stop staring you in the face, you know, it's like, I think that helps. And it's like, think about what you can lose. The, the reason so many fail is they see the, you know, the jets and the Lamborghinis and the yachts, but they don't think about the downside. Yeah, exactly. You worry about what you can lose, not about what you can make. You know? Yeah, that's good. That's good. Awesome. Thank you, Jack. This was oh, sure. so sure. much fun. It yeah. was just a pleasure to have you and your wisdom here. Oh, nice I really, you. really hope you'll come back. And oh, yeah, sure. You know, just, just, you know, I, I think what you have to offer people is that accessibility to imagining themselves and their personalities, if it's a match, right? If they're a match for trading and that lots of personalities could be a match, but you have to do your due diligence and is what I'm hearing. the thing is uh, people always find a different, different chapter that resonates with them, you know? So when people tell me, hey, you know what my favorite chapter is? I have no idea because it's never the same chapter, you know? <laughs> One of the interesting things, yeah. What's your favorite? Do you well? You probably can't say you have a favorite chapter. No, you can. Well, I, I, for me, favorite chapter is more a matter from a. It's more from the writing standpoint. So, yeah, you know, it's who gives me the best material to work with, right? <laughs> and you can usually tell, you can usually tell that from what the first chapter is, because that's what I found the most, you know, like the be yeah. best, you know, material uh, that provides the best, you know, getting into the book and reading. Uh, there was an exception in hedge fund market was it's what I thought was my favorite chapter was not the first because it was two, it was the longest chapter in the book. And it was also the longest chapter in any market was a book. And so it wasn't the first chapter. So in that case, that, that rule doesn't hold. But, wow. Uh, you know, I wanted to ask you, and it's probably kind of a two tail end, but were you starstruck along those years yeah. with anyone that you just were like, oh, 
No, you no, were no. one of the ones I was starstruck with. So that's why I was you. It's not my personality. You know, it's not my personality. I'm just, uh, I was just basically just trying to get as much as I could out of them. Yes. Okay. Intimidated? Have it intimidated by anybody? No. No. no? no. Good for no. you. No, I mean, no, I'm going in. I don't consider myself a good trader. So there's a, I, my question is, can I, can, can I stay on their level intellectually? Um, and, and so I never feel intimidated in that, you know, I never, I mean, certainly I've interviewed people who are a lot smarter than I am, but as long as, and that's really true because I, you know, people like, uh, like Ed Thorpe or D. Sh David Shaw, I mean, how many these people are, you know, I'm a dummy compared to them. But <laughs> I, I, I still felt that I was, I could converse on, uh, on, a, on a reasonable level. That's all I, but I, so I, you know, I, I kind of didn't have that, in intimidation sense you know that's good it's a it's a great quality for me to try to emulate well especially well, with well. you because i was so starstruck that you had said yes and i i just i can't tell you how nervous i was going into my interview with you it was pretty intense i don't know yeah because you know, it's just not my person that you know I, I just i don't get i'm not that type, i don't get starstruck by uh <laughs> well if you had to interview you maybe you would have <laughs> no 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 no, no. I've interviewed people who are actually, you know, way better than I could ever be. So, yes, but for what you've represented me in this industry and uh, who you are and who you've met and how you've rolled, it was it was a big moment for me. So, just right. thanks for not you made you put me right at ease. So, I, I still remember doing the interview. Do you remember we were up in the in your apartment building common area? Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, I was living in uh, that. Uh, that con uh, at a condo up at 57th Street. I think it had the skylights and stuff. It was kind of a nice area. Yeah. It was a really nice area. Yeah. And you put me right at ease and you were just so gracious and it was an amazing experience. I'll never forget it. So anyway, I'm still a little starstruck by you, Jack. I hope that's okay. <laughs> I, 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 I think I'm the same where I'm getting interviewed or doing the interview. So it's pretty much, I, I don't change you. So just thank you. Anything well, again, to... yeah, yeah, um, um, definitely. Thanks, Jack. I would like to thank you for appearing sure. on the podcast and, and being so so gracious and open. And, uh, you know, to the listener out there, you can go to jackschwager.com. Um, also, if you're listening on, I always like to remember remind you, if you're listening on iTunes or on Android, you can go to steadytrade.com. We'll have all the links there. We'll have the links to Jack's book. Jack does some speaking. You know, we mentioned that, you know, if you're that trader out there with a track record and maybe you want to be in his book, you could reach out there. So, um, so yeah, again, if you're, if you're listening just on the audio, you can definitely go to steadytrade.com. We'll link everything there. And again, Jack, I, I really appreciate you coming on. And uh, do you have a rough, I mean, I know you're working on it. Do you have a rough, idea on when the new book will hit or not yeah uh well yeah so we're coming into cross-country ski season so that <laughs> blows me up. Um, and you know because at my age i'm not going to sacrifice any season you know but to get a book out a couple of months earlier so i i think realistically uh probably about mid-year next year is what okay perfect perfect awesome and i also mentioned that uh, the traders who want to get the soft you know get free software to analyze their trading they can go to funseeder.com, you know. So. Beautiful. Perfect. Perfect. Awesome. Jack, thank so we'll, you. Uh, so we'll much. definitely, you know, and again, if, if uh, as, as I mentioned, if that fundseeder.com. And also, you know, again, if you're driving, don't write that down. You can just go to the website and we'll link all that below. So, again, thanks a lot, Jack. Okay, and thanks fun. a lot, Kim. Have so, a good one. Thank you. Thank you.